we're being reminded of how blessed we are to be Americans, how much more so being blessed by being Christians, the sons and daughters of God, to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Amazing. Some grandparents took their three-year-old grandson out to Chuck E. Cheese's for pizza and noisy rides. After the evening, as the grandmother was buckling the little guy into his car seat in the back seat, she said to him, now be sure and tell Papa thank you. Silence. No response. She asked him, did you hear me? Be sure and say thank you to Papa. Well, the grandfather was in the front seat ignoring this backseat conversation, but then he decided to jump in and he said, you know, Papa enjoys doing nice things for grandchildren, especially when they say thank you. More silence. Did you hear Papa? He asked, a bit irritated. Uh-huh, but still no thank you. And now Grandpa was a little upset and he goes, are you ignoring me? The volume of his voice amping up just a little bit. And then this response. I'm thankful, Papa. I just don't want to say it. I can relate to that little boy. I can, I can relate to that little boy in my worship of God. I love him. I, I'm, I'm thankful. I, I depend on him. I need him. But, but, but sometimes I just don't feel like saying it. The prophetic last book of the Bible gives a powerful and awesome appeal to worship God. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, if you want to open your Bibles there, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, John writes, Then I saw, he saw in vision, amazing. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Consider this amazing prophecy. John sees in vision the eternal gospel being preached around the world. The good news of salvation by grace through faith in Christ is being proclaimed by, to everyone just as Jesus foretold in Matthew 24, 14. Here in the context of warning about false worship in the time of the end, in a time of crisis and conflict, and yes, eager anticipation for Jesus' return, this message in Revelation is fear God, take him seriously, and worship him. Worship him who created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. Worship him. Worship him through all kinds of life experiences. Worship him when you don't feel like it. Worship him when you're tired. Worship him when you're bored. Worship him when your heart is breaking. Jeremy Bergby tells a story about attending a worship service in a poor South African township. Bergby was told immediately before the service that a house around the corner had been burned to the ground the night before because the man who lived there was a suspected thief. A week before that, a tornado had cut through the township, ripping apart 50 homes. Five people were killed. And then he was told that very night before, there was a gang that hounded down a 14-year-old member of their church, and stabbed him to death. What a solemn time for those poor people as they gathered to worship that day. And as the pastor began, he began with an opening prayer with, Lord, you are the creator and sovereign. But why? Why did the wind come like a snake and tear off our roofs? Why did a mob cut short the life of one of our very own children when he had everything to live for? Over and over again, Lord, we live in the midst of death. As he prayed, the congregation responded with dreadful, dreadful sighs and moans. And then, once the pastor finished his prayer, the congregation began to sing, very quietly at first. 
and then louder and louder. They sang and they sang song after song of praise. Praise to a God who in Jesus had plunged into the very worst to give us the promise of an ending beyond our imagining. Their singing gave that congregation a foretaste of the end. Their worship helped them to breathe some of the fresh air of God's ending, tasting some of the spices and sipping from the sweet cup of the heavenly feast that is yet to come. Today we're concluding a sermon series on discipleship that we began in March. And in this series we've examined the, the disciplines of discipleship, those, those actions, those habits, practices that can help us to grow as disciples of Jesus. We've talked about prayer, becoming a person of prayer. We've discussed how to develop a quiet time with God. We've learned at the looked at the importance of Bible reading and study in our spiritual development. We've emphasized that we have a responsibility in our spiritual growth. That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, discipline yourself. Discipline yourself for what purpose? The purpose of godliness. We're called, amazingly enough, to become more and more like Jesus. And that takes some some discipline on our part, some effort. As Paul taught young Timothy, we must discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. Our Father and our Heavenly Father wants us to become more and more like Him and His Son, Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, what can I do to grow as a Christian? Is there anything, anything I can do to help me to become more like Jesus? I believe the answer is yes. I can pray. I can learn to pray in some new ways. I can read my Bible. I can learn to memorize and meditate on God's word. And I can worship. Yes, I can worship. You see, worship is an act of discipleship. Doesn't the appeal of that first angel call us, even command us in these last days to worship him? Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. We've already noted the first angel's message calls us to fear God. I don't believe that means to be afraid of God, but to take God seriously. Revelation 14 also calls us to give him glory. And that makes me think of 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do, do it for what? Do it for, do it for the glory of God. I can worship to become more like Jesus. I can worship to give God glory in my relationship with him. Here's a fact. Godliness without worship is impossible. Godliness without worship is impossible. But here's the danger. Our worship can miss the mark. Consider Jesus' warning in Matthew 15, verse 8 and 9, when he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. The Message Bible uses the vernacular of how we talk today. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they're worshiping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching for whatever suits their fancy. You see, our worship can miss the mark. We can worship and not have our hearts in it. We all know that to be true. We've all experienced that. Our worship can be a cover-up for just kind of going through the right motions, not having the right focus. Indeed, the appeal of Revelation 14 to worship God is in the context of a time when the world as a whole will think they're worshiping God, but they're actually worshiping the beast the powers and persons of Antichrist. It's pretty sobering. Sobering indeed. But the Bible doesn't just warn us against false worship. It describes worship that is right and true. So today, won't you join me in considering four facets of biblical worship. Number one, worship is focusing on and responding to God. In John chapter 10, we find the story of Thomas. Thomas was one of those disciples who had witnessed the arrest, torture, and death of Jesus on a cross. Absolutely traumatized by that. 
Unfortunately, he was not with the other disciples when the resurrected Jesus first appeared. And so he was, he was struggling to accept the truth of this heart-stopping eyewitness testimony. He's alive. He's really alive. Jesus is alive. And he was struggling to embrace that because he hadn't seen with his own eyes, touched with his own hands. And when the risen Jesus does appear to Thomas and the others, he immediately cries out in an act of worship. We can see it in John 20, verse 28, where he says, My Lord and my God. Can you imagine what it was like to see Jesus alive after witnessing his crucifixion? My Lord and my God. In Revelation 4, 8, we're told that the four creatures around the throne of God worship day and night saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And, and the Bible says that as the four living creatures are worshiping God, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. The Bible goes on to show how they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. God is at the center of worship. God is at the center of biblical worship. To worship him is to ascribe proper worth to God, to, to acknowledge his holiness, to magnify his worthiness. He is worthy of all the honor and respect and reverence we can give and infinitely more. The more we focus on him, the more we focus on God, the more we understand and appreciate how worthy he is. But something else happens in our worship that we don't always talk about. And that is the closer I come to a holy God in worship, the more I can come to understand and realize my own unholiness. To be exposed to our holy God should bring about a response in me in which I examine my life, I examine my own state of affairs. You see it over and over again in Scripture where God is worshipped. And the worshiper cries out because his or her spiritual condition is exposed. That's what happened to Isaiah. You can see that in Isaiah in chapter 6 of his book where he cries out, Woe is me, for I'm undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. To become aware of the holy presence of God is a life-altering experience. When God is worshipped, people become transparent or more transparent. We're not worshipping if we're not focusing on God and responding to him. We may be in church. We may be in a building, singing songs, reading scripture, listening to a sermon. But without focusing on God and responding to him, we're not worshipping we may be just going through the motions. We can only be worshiping God by focusing on him and responding to him. Consider another facet of biblical worship. Worship is conducted in spirit and in truth. Profound scripture on the subject, subject of worship is found in the Gospel of John chapter 4. John tells the story of Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman and the fact that he was talking to a Samaritan was pretty remarkable because unfortunately the Jews had a terrible prejudice against the Samaritans and wanted nothing to do with them. And then the fact that he was talking to a, a woman, a Samaritan woman, made it even more astonishing. But to this precious woman, precious to Jesus, to this open-hearted woman, Jesus made this profound statement about worship. He declared, but an hour is coming and now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. And then he goes on to say in John 4 verse 24. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Before you can worship in spirit and truth. You must have within you the one who is the spirit of truth. And who is that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in those who have come to Christ in repentance and faith. 
Without the Holy Spirit, we are not able to worship. Without the Spirit, true worship will not happen. In my own experience, I've been helped again and again by learning to pray for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit from day to day. To worship God in spirit is to worship from the inside out. In order to have this sincere, authentic spirit in worship, we need the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then when the scripture talks about worshiping in truth, it's, it's talking about the root truth revealed in scripture. There are just so many attributes of God that are revealed in scripture. Scripture talks about a God who is loving. Scripture reveals a God who is patient and kind. But scripture also revol- reveals a God who is strong, a God who is just, a God who will judge the living and the dead, and that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God is described in Scripture as a jealous God. You see that in Exodus 28. He's a jealous God who does not allow worship to be given to just anyone else, certainly not any other God who comes along. As Revelation 14 says, worship him. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Worship God as creator. Worship God as savior. Worship him as Lord. God must be worshiped in spirit and truth for it to be true worship. The Bible reveals God to us so that we can have a clear understanding of who he is and how we should respond. We should not stop worshiping God just because we don't understand him and his ways fully, because we sure don't. We worship him as friend and Lord, someone we can comprehend, begin to comprehend, but never fully. And so we're called to worship God in spirit and in truth. Consider another facet of worship. Worship is expressed both publicly and privately. We are all invited to participate regularly in public worship. We read in Hebrews 10 this admonition. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And then the author of Hebrews goes on to say, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You might want to underline in your Bible the words in verse 25, assembling together. The NIV says, let's not give up meeting together. That means we as Christians are to gather with other believers for the purpose of worship. Christianity is not an isolationist religion. There are to be no Lone Ranger Christians. But then even the Lone Ranger had Tonto, right? (laughs) The New Testament describes the church as a body, a building, a family. And each of these terms speaks of a relationship between individual units and that of the whole. We are individually Christian and collectively we're Christian too. The author of Hebrews even gives us this reason to assemble together, and that is to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Our getting together is to encourage others, to encourage others' believers, and and to encourage those who are seeking the Lord. We should always be looking for ways to encourage each other to love as Jesus did. Worshiping together habitually is one of the ways to do that. On the other hand, public worship alone will not satisfy our need to meet and worship God privately. Luke tells us the story of Jesus, the habit of Jesus in Luke 5.16. How Jesus continued his habit of retiring to deserted places and praying. The Bible shows us Jesus faithfully participated in public worship. He also faithfully practiced private worship as well. The Bible commentator Matthew Henry once said, public worship will not excuse us from secret worship. We must worship God publicly with others and in private as well. That was the habit of Jesus and is an example for it to be a habit for us as well. Which brings us to one more facet of worship. Worship is a discipline to be learned and practiced. Jesus instructed us in Matthew 4.10, worship 
the Lord your God and serve him only. To worship the Lord throughout our lifetime takes discipline. Without discipline, our worship will just be inconsistent at best. We've read in Hebrews of our need to consistently assemble together so that we can encourage one another, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Forming such holy habits takes consistency, which takes discipline. But here's a word of caution. Remember, worship is focusing and responding to God. My footprints can lead me to the habit of worship, but my heartbeats must lead me to a love relationship with God. Such love flows from God. It flows as a gift from God. It's not about us and our discipline. It's about him and his gifts of grace. There is no higher goal than to focus on God and to respond to God in love. And the more we worship God, the more we become like him who is love. Ellen White, one of our church pioneers, understood that worship is, in part, a discipline to be learned and practiced. Consider a couple of her statements about worship this morning. Here's one. If you sit in heavenly places with Christ, you cannot refrain from praising God. Begin to educate your tongues to praise him and train your hearts to make melody to God. And when the evil one begins to settle his gloom about you, sing. Sing praise to God. Like a three-year-old boy who doesn't want to say thank you to his papa, we can learn to sing. We can learn to say what we think and how we feel about God. We can educate our tongues and train our hearts to worship God with his help, with his spirit and love. Have you ever tried singing when you don't feel like it? And found that God used that song, particularly a song of praise, to lift your spirits and help you to connect with God and increase your love for him? I've sure experienced that again and again. Here's another statement about the discipline of worship. There's too much formality, too much formality in our religious services. The Lord would have his ministers who preach the word to be energized by his Holy Spirit. And the people who here should not sit in drowsy indifference, or I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here this morning. The people here should not be sitting in drowsy indifference or stare vacantly about. Nobody, don't, don't look around right now. So the people here should not sit in drowsy indifference or stare vacantly about, making no responses to what is said. The impression that is given to the unbeliever is anything but favorable for the religion of Christ. And then this final statement, where the church is walking in the light, where the church is walking in the light, the light of God, the light of the love of God, the light of the gospel and the good news of Jesus. When the church is walking in the light, there will be ever cheerful, hearty responses and words of joyful praise. Seriously, probably most of us, myself included, would honor God and help others if I would learn to be more responsive in worship. We're worshiping who here from Sabbath to Sabbath? We're worshiping God. We're worshiping God from Sabbath to Sabbath. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He is our Savior. He is our friend. I need to be energized more by his Holy Spirit. We all do. God is not honored by drowsy indifference in church where there's no responses made to songs and prayers and testimonies in the teaching and preaching of his word. So let me bring this, this last sentence that's on the screen a little closer to home. Where East Salem Adventist Church is walking in the light, there will ever be cheerful, hearty responses and words of joyful praise. Amen? Remember what I said at the beginning of the sermon? Godliness without the worship of God is impossible. It's a true statement. People become what they focus on. We emulate what we think about. Paul said it this way in Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's what I found in life. I become what I focus on. I become what I'm committed to. As a child, I committed to following Jesus. And after all these years, I'm still following Jesus as a disciple. As a teenager, I accepted the good news that salvation really is by grace through faith. And I committed myself to live in grace 
and the assurance of salvation. And praise God, I still have that peace after all those years. As a teenager, I accepted God's calling on my life to become a pastor and, and not wait till I finished college, but to begin soon, as soon as I could, in every opportunity to be involved in gospel ministry. And I still live in awe of God's calling on my life. As a young adult, I committed myself to love and cherish Peggy, and I'm still committed to loving Peggy as my precious wife. See, all of these commitments, these significant relationships and commitments have shaped my life. How about you? Will you commit to Jesus? Will you commit to following him in discipleship? Will you commit to worshiping him in your daily life from, and from Sabbath to Sabbath? Nancy Orberg tells of how she worked as a registered nurse before her life took her down a, a different career path. And one of her first patients as a nurse was a young girl about 14 years old who had been in a dirt bike accident. She met her down in physical therapy, Nancy did. The girl was in a whirlpool bath, but Nancy had done her homework before they met. And Nancy had learned that as a result of the accident, the girl's leg had been amputated below the knee. Can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine being a 14-year-old girl and having part of your leg missing? Nancy introduced herself. They made some small talk. They visited a little bit. In time, she learned that the girl was a follower of Jesus, although she didn't make a big deal about that. But Nancy wasn't prepared for her spirit, especially when she lifted her freshly amputated leg out of the bubbling water and said, Look at how much I have left. She was so excited because they had explained to her that with that, the amputation below her knee would be easier to fit her with a prosthesis. And she was wondering out loud how long it was going to take to you know, start that whole process. And they were talking about other things, but Nancy says, I could hardly listen to the other things that were being said in this exchange because my mind kept going back to that expression, look how much I have left. Her gratitude seemed genuine. It wasn't denial or a Pollyanna mentality. She knew she was missing a good part of her leg. She wouldn't have chosen that. But she was so thankful for this bit of good news. Nancy said, her spirit made my spirit just soar that day. And I have two good legs. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful. Let us be thankful and so worship God. Expressing our gratitude, our thankfulness, is a way we worship God. We can sing, and that is worship. We can say thank you, and that is worship. That day in a hospital, the gratitude of a 14-year-old girl helped a Christian nurse lift her heart and spirit in worship. Let's accept the invitation of Hebrews 12, 28 today. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God. Let's worship him today. Let's worship him from Sabbath to Sabbath. Let's worship him in public. Let's worship him in private. Let's worship him in good times. Let's worship him in bad times. As Revelation 14 says, worship him who made the heavens the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Worship him who created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. Worship him. Is that your desire in your relationship with the Lord as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Is it your desire to follow him as a disciple, to grow in his grace, to be thankful, and to worship him? Is that your desire today? Shall we stand for prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we praise you for being our awesome God. We praise you for being our creator. We praise you for being our redeemer. We praise you for being our friend. Yes, and we praise you for being Lord. We praise you for Jesus, who's made it possible for us to have a whole new experience, a whole new relationship with you, a whole new life. And Lord, we would just pray that 
you would in each of us, in our hearts, in our homes, in our relationships, that you would continue to lead us back to you. You would continue to show us what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. That you would help us to put into practice those things that will help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to worship. In his name we pray. Amen.